if we can keep it short. Good morning, pair of and retrogrades. Today I have with you a special guest, Mrs. Julia Maloney, who is the author of a book that's a very important book generating tons of interest, Sankt Gallen Mafia. And I have her here as a special guest for you, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades, on its publication date. Uh, so, uh, Julia, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, welcome back to the show, I should say. We, we talked about this book when it was like a twinkle in your eye, right? Or when you had a few chapters in. And now it's done and it's um, being published and it's being distributed. And I think people are getting their copies in the mail, aren't they? Um, yeah, um, there's been kind of an issue with some of the shipping just because we had our publisher had changed shipments. So um, I just want everyone to know, like, if you don't get if you ordered from Tan and you don't get your book today, it's I promise it's coming. I haven't gotten my copies yet, but I know that they are coming. Yeah, when the case for patriarchy came out, la you know, at the beginning of the month, it was like all of the people out there, Parish Orphans, Retrogrades, fans of the show and, um, you know, burgeoning fans of the book were getting into the mail and were saying, hey, I'm already two or three chapters in. I just got it mm. today. It's so exciting. I hadn't received my box of books. So a lot of times, given the uh, contingencies of the mail, it can be difficult. But here's with, with Song Gallen Mafia, your book, Julia, your excellent book that so many people are excited about. I, I want to say a few things because I've already interviewed you on this. and I don't want to repeat a lot of questions, but this explains to a willing reader without, without over tipping your hand too much, just good journalism, I would say. It explains the origin of the Francis pontificate, right? It's, it's how Bergoglio became Pope Francis. And that's not a, and it's a darkling story. Is that fair enough to say? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, you know, as a writer, when I got my start at Crisis Magazine, you know, I was just kind of reacting in the moment to things that were happening. I, I started writing a few weeks um, or months after Amoris came out. And as I continued writing, I found that backstory was really important and really interesting to me. And when I, you know, when I read The Dictator Pope um, by Henry Sear and I read that first chapter about the St. Gallen Mafia, I knew that that was the key, the interpretive key to understanding the pontificate. But, um, you know, they started meeting in 1996, but there's stuff in this book, you know, talking about the 70s, talking about what was Casper doing in the 70s with Karl Rahner. Yep. what was, um, you know, all, all of these other things. So, so there, you know, you, it, it's something that the more, the further you go back, you know, the more characters kind of pop up and, and everything. So it, um, but it's, it's a fascinating story. It's definitely something that's been, whether anyone understood it as such, it's been in the works, you know, for decades, basically. Just yesterday, Jeffrey Sachs of the UN and one of the key architects of uh, Agenda 2030, a uh, population control enthusiast for decades, was invited into the Pontifical Academy uh, for life, I believe. And everyone knows that he was around the Vatican the first summer of this pontificate and many summers thereafter where he was uh, allegedly helping Pope Francis draft up um, key key phrases from within Laudato Si. That's that's what's been alleged by some. So, I mean, the idea of having someone like Jeffrey Sachs, kind of an arch nemesis of the church, I, I don't think you could say kind of, an arch nemesis of the church, as an inside player in not only, you know, I mean, I mean in faith, faith and morals, let's say that, because we're talking about freaking encyclicals being drafted and now one of the the uh, dicasteries academies the one on life where against jeffrey Sachs stands the most diametrically so this comes from cardinal martini does it not i mean that this is the idea expressed within that short phrase that martini said um 
Yeah, well, there are actually lots of little Martiniisms in the book that I'm, I've been telling people. I've been saying, but doesn't this come from Cardinal Martini? That's what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think that it also comes from, you know, Carl Rahner. Um, I, I mentioned him before, but basically um, the, the eminent historian Roberto de Matei says that Pope Francis's grandfather is Rahner and his father is Martini, so to speak. So Rahner, um, there, there's this great Italian book um, by Stefano Fontana. <clears throat> and it's basically, the premise is that Rahner taught the, the church how to surrender to the world. And, you know, that's something that Martini then picked up and, and he was constantly surrendering as well. So that's what this Sachs appointment really represents. It's a surrender to some of the architects of, of the culture of, of death and population control and, and, you know, so many very, very worrisome things. So, yeah, it's like a manufactured consent to the world. What does this mean? <laughs> what does this mean for the church? You don't say in the book, but what do you think it means? Um, I, I think it means basically that we we need we need a obviously a, a purification a counter-revolution we um these moments of crisis they they spur you to define your identity better and i know a lot of people in the francis pontificate have defined their catholic identities much better um one thing you know that that i've been kind of mentioning in some of these interviews is you know, I, for the first three years of this pontificate, I was the biggest fan of Pope Francis and his agenda. I know that you have spoken about how you were red-pilled very early on about the Synod on the family. You were warning people while that was happening. You know, I was just obliv oblivious. I was reading positive coverage. I never read any negative coverage of him hmm. um, of, of any kind. And, and this literally happened for, for three years. And it, it was in 2016 when Amoris came out that I finally read critical um, essays on it. Um, I read a lot in Crisis Magazine and you know, started writing there and, and had to investigate it. But in, in that course, you know, I've made a lot of changes in terms of just understanding better what I believe um, understanding better, you know, how I want to practice my faith. Um, I've become more traditional. I was, I already identified as a, as a Catholic conservative, but I have, have become more traditional and kind of more knowledgeable about, yeah. about things. So I definitely think that um, this can be something to where the, the counter-revolution can define itself better and perhaps come out stronger through all of this. Yeah, I, I'm curious about, well, maybe you could tell the audience here who haven't yet read your book the way I've, I've had the chance to and, and to forward it, which was a great honor. The last two chapter titles and a little synopsis about what the last two chapters of the book are. Um, I think they're nice foreshadowers of what we should expect in the next year or two. Yeah, um, so the... The second to last chapter is called Patience and the last chapter is called Time. And um, the second half of the book is called Time. So we have two, two uses of the word time in there because time is so important to, to Pope Francis. Of course, one of his postulates is time is greater than space. Yep. Um, and it, it seems like this arcane esoteric phrase that he likes to throw out there. But I, I think that it's actually very it's, it's very pregnant with meaning, you know, it's basically, it's very similar to another phrase he has called traveling in patience, um, where you can, you can harness time to get what you want, basically. You know, you, you can have, Bergoglio had a lot of failures in life, um, so to speak, or, you know, when you read his biography, you, you see that there were, he had moments where, you know, he, he was kind of, on, you know, on top of things, but he also had moments where, you know, he, he wanted to be early on, he wanted to go to Japan as a missionary, but um, 
he had this lung operation and so he wasn't allowed to go there and he, he had to stay and just teach high school literature. So that was, uh, the, I think that was a failure that kind of he took personally. So you can have these setbacks, but what, what matters is how you end up, okay? So I think that a lot of things in the agenda, the Francis pontificate, which is the Martini agenda, right? Um, celibacy, um, overturning priestly celibacy, getting the ordination of married men, ordination of deaconesses, um, that sort of thing. Th there are a lot of failures, but um, in terms of, you know, not being able to immediately clinch that goal, like right after the synod that, that, that covers that topic. But if you're traveling in patience or time is greater than space, what matters is where you end up and everything. So I think that um, to me, what I like to say is basically when this, when this book was done editing um, a couple weeks later was when Tradiciones Custodes came out. Mm -hmm. And I just remember just, I was taken aback. I had heard, you know, some of the, the rumblings that um, some of our great journalists had had uncovered about something that was coming, but it was so absolutist and so iron fisted that mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I was I was very surprised, and I wrote an essay about it for one Peter five, kind of talking about the Saint Gallen Mafia's war on the traditional Latin Mass, and then of course we had the Synod on synodality as well. And to me, these two things, Traditionis Custodis and the Synod on Synodality, they have more of the mood of an end game to the pontificate. Yeah. Um, it, it, to me, the, the tone, it, um, I think, uh, again, Roberto de Mate, who I, who I totally, you know, respect so much, he was kind of saying that, I, I think during the, some of the COVID stuff last year, he was kind of saying that the pontificate of Francis was kind of over, like n nothing else was going to happen. And, and, then, it, and then we had these things happen. So um, I, I think it's, it's a very ominous kind of afterward. The, again, these things aren't covered in the book, but, um, but I've been writing these articles kind of, kind of previewing what, what we might, you know, how, how things might accelerate. There's that phrase, things accelerate toward, toward the end and stuff and so th that's kind of the mood that i'm getting at least yeah there's so much so much good stuff you said i mean i'm reminded of this latin expression uh about you know that do the just rule by sword you know justi in gladio uh mm -hmm. regnant and pope francis always says yes and we got a real taste of that with with you know july 16th Moti proprio, of course, just just cruel. Like what a cruel, cruel and hateful temperament. So, <clears throat> I mean, you really get a taste of it. That has been accelerated over the last four years. And I guess what's really neat about your last two chapters is without, you're not bludgeoning anyone with these truths, but it's like, oh, when I read Julia Maloney's book, these last two chapters in particular, after showing us for the entire book, the final two chapters are like, this is the soul of incrementalism. This mm -hmm. is the soul of how the left, it, to whatever extent one gives credence to the idea of the Alta Vendita, the intercepted document that says they are going to incrementally infiltrate, you know, by they, I mean the bad guys, infiltrate the Vatican, and give us someone like Francis. <laughs> I mean, it's it's been done, and it was done leading up to the start of Francis's pontificate, and it's been done within Francis's pontificate itself. When people, you know, you're a, you're a shrewd observer. You said for three years you bought it. I yeah, literally, I wrote a piece uh, that was so probably violently against Laudato Si. I couldn't place it anywhere, even mm. at the usual suspects who. I don't even think crisis wanted to touch it because it was so immediate and it was so young. It was less than a year into the pontificate. And I was like, oh, this sucks. I wrote like a 2000 word piece. So Francis has 
incrementally shown himself. I don't think he could be more damasked than he is after the Mochi Proprio, really beginning in 2016. So I'm curious how long he's going to survive because I think from here on out, I, I, I have the, I like uh, Roberto de Mate too, but I have the exact opposite impression. I think now he's just at cruising speed. And he's going to be doing stuff as long as he survives. And I think that's really insinuated by, you know, the implications of Sankt Gallen Mafia agenda. Remember, Cardinal Walter Brandmuller told us the order that this would all move in, in like 2014. It would be mm -hmm. first the communion for the divorce and civilly remarried. Then it would be, you know, deaconesses and, um, and very pro body. And then it would be intercommunion with the Lutherans. Do you see that happening? That was a great dream of the St. Gallen Mafia, wasn't it? Um, yeah, um, I, I think that Francis, the, the key again is he has already planted the seeds for, you know, so many different things, in, including the intercommunion. So if, if we woke up tomorrow and we had intercommunion, you, you would be able to say, okay, here's the trajectory that got us there. You know, when he decides to pull the trigger, so to speak, on, on any issue, um, I, I think again, Tradiciones Custodas, um, if it weren't for some of the really good journalists that we had um, breaking some of the, you know, the details before it happened, um, you know, we, we, we would have been in for an even greater surprise that, yeah. that this was happening because everyone sort of thought that, you know, we, we had the usual suspects for the things like the very pro body. Um, and, and this, this was something, this was something totally, totally different. Why does everyone say, even on the right wing, still a lot of folks say it, that, Francis is kind of being led around by the nose by these Northern European cardinals. Oh, why, I mean, why make that assumption? I, I, it's an excuse that was used for some of John Paul II's uh, major blunders, and there were there were several. Even though he had he had some real strengths in that pontificate, he had some real blunders. But I mean, he had Parkinson's, right? So that that makes more sense for kind of center right Catholics to to marshal in favor of jp2 when the parkinson's is taking over i don't think it explains away all his weaknesses by any stretch of the imagination but the point is the rebuttable presumption that one should land on first if a guy is in charge if he's jefe the way pope francis is jefe is that his underlings even if they're his c14 or whatever his advisors that he's imperious and he's doing what he wants to do. Now this is rebuttable. Sometimes you find out that there was a, you know, a, um, some sort of liaison in the court of the King that was really the, the muscle and was, was pushing even the King around, but that's not the first presumption. Why do we keep hearing this? Um, it, at this point, you know, it, it, it feels like another form of denial. I mean, it feels like, you know, something that, that I, I remember, you know, the, the, the first three years when I said, you know, I, I would not criticize anything that happened in this pontificate. And my sister would call me and sometimes she would tell me a report. And I had these, you know, prepackaged answers. Oh, he's, he's from Latin America. He, he's a Jesuit. He's not understood. It's someone else. Uh, that sort of thing, you know, that that's what it kind of feels like. But I think that definitely you, you were talking about how Pope Francis, um, I, I mean, some of the things we know about, about his character and Henry Sear has talked so much about, you know, his character and, and the relationship with power. Um, I, I think that we also know that he is a planner um, yeah. he, he was once asked if you, if you were to rescue something out of a, a burning building, what would it be? And he said, my breviary and my agenda, my schedule. Yeah. Um, so he, he, um, his friend, Elizabeth Piquet, um, talks about how 
you know, he, at the time of the conclave, he had a black, a black plastic watch and it becomes almost symbolic because he never likes to be tardy. Even though he says time is greater than space, he doesn't want to be tardy at the same time. So when you, when you take some of these aspects of his personality and then the aspect where, you know, he made that change from being an ultra conservative in his earlier days to becoming more liberal and kind of being a fellow traveler to the St. Gallen Mafia. Um, he, he has, it, it just seems to me like um, he has this personality that is, um, he, he's able to execute things, but he's also able to plan them as, as well. So I think that he's very much in control of the agenda here. And, you know, it's definitely important to acknowledge that. Yeah, that's that's um, that's a great answer. It's a great book, really. People go get today. Sankt Gallen Mafia from Tan Books by Julia Maloney. Excellent, excellent. It's not going to let you down. It is full of stuff you've never read about Pope Francis and his origins. I want. I'd like to turn to some history questions in a second, but I'd, I'd also like to remind people to go buy a case for patriarchy today because that's newly out this month as well. I'd also like to remind you, if you'd like to support this program, go to patreon.com, Timothy J. Gordon. We have a new tier called the St. Luke's Single Society, and uh, people are flocking to that because uh, traditional-minded Catholics are not knowing what to do. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's another bonus if you become a patron of Timothy Gordon. Like, subscribe, and get notified when a video is coming up. I try not to badger you guys, but that's a bad idea because badgering works. And then finally, I'd like to kick a quick video by video shout out to Real Estate for Life. They can help you get out of your blue state into a red state. Go to realestateforlife.org. Julia, I'd like to ask you some history questions if, if you don't mind. Um, Francis was, like you said, a couple things that I'd like the parish orphans out there to remember. He's from Latin America, but he's 100% Italiano by blood, right? A lot of people forget that. And I think, I mean, to, to the extent that you believe that these things are sort of influential at the very least, you know, you, you said you gave the um, Pope explaining excuse for three years. Oh, well, he's Latin American. He's a Latin American by adoption. Both his Italian parents moved there, but he's 100% Italian. So this makes an extra interesting bromide temperamentally, I think. But as far back as 1996, which is what you know and what others have reported as the red letter date beginning for Sankt Gallen Mafia, how did they know that early on that he was the guy for them, the unique guy for them that they needed to get into the pontificate and they spent a decade working on it, nearly, nearly got it done um, at the Benedict Conclave in 2003. How did they know that early? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that they, the, the very beginning of, of how Bergoglio got on their radar, it's either ambiguous, um, like there's, there's just not literature on it, or um, I, I think one of, one of the earliest dates that we have um, is 2001. And that's when Austin Ivory says that um, Bergoglio reconnected with Martini at our consistory and Martini introduced him to a lot of the mafia members. And then there was a synod later that year. And at that synod, um, Bergoglio kind of impressed the mafia because he he spoke he did a good job talking about collegiality basically and they, they saw him as a fellow traveler. Um, now we also know that in 2003 Silvestrini, Achilles Silvestrini replaced Martini and according to Nicholas Diat, you know at some point before the 2005 conclave, Silvestrini, tried to convince Bergoglio to lead the anti-Ratzinger con contingent. So 
the question is, you know, I've seen stuff where Silvestrini in the 90s was saying we need a Latin American pope, a pope from Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, did, is that, a, is that a coincidence? And then there's this, this issue, you remember from the book that there's this mysterious text called Confession of a Cardinal. Yes. And it's a French text. And, you know, personally, I, I think the mysterious cardinal is Silvestrini or it's modeled on Silvestrini. It just seems like there are too many coincidences, um, you know, where, where different parts of their biography are, are, are lining up. But there's this fascinating part where, you know, they're saying um, the mysterious cardinal says, we thought of, of having a pope um, from La Latin America with European roots, and we thought of Cardinal Bergoglio. So he, he mentions right. this book was published in 2007, and the conversation allegedly took place in 2005 after Benedict was elected. They, they were talking about Bergoglio at that period about how Bergoglio had done, had placed second in the 2005 conclave. And they were talking about like, we have, um, he says something like, we have to keep in mind, you know, his performance because at one point he got 35 votes. We have to keep this in mind. Um, and again, I'm paraphrasing here. Um, just in case Benedict's pontificate does not last long. Indeed, Bergoglio is 68 years old. So, right. so th there's, I mean, I, I read those, I mean, and th there are different moments where my jaw just dropped researching yeah. this and I, I'm reading yeah. this and it's published in 2007 and they're talking about Bergoglio in this way. So it's um, a, lot, a lot of questions, even if we don't know the exact, ex exactly when he came on the radar, um, he, he definitely was, he was still on the radar, you know, after Benedict was elected. When you say it, this, I have this question, clarification question mm -hmm. from the book. Silvestrini was in the group before he replaced Martini as the Don, uh, you, you know, Tutto di Tutti Capi, or was he not in the group at all before Martini died? I was unclear on that. Um, if I'm understanding the literature correctly, I, <clears throat> I thought he wasn't in the group at all. And okay, then, no, and then he came in and he replaced Martini. But I, I just want to be honest, I, I could have misunderstood something. Um, no, I, I doubt you did. That, that was probably just me uh, fast reading. And I, I read this. I need to reread your book, but I read it months ago to write uh, the forward. So can you, t I know you didn't want to make too much of this or tip your hand too much, but come on, I have to ask the in between, I think the third and the fourth scrutinies at the 2005 conclave, there is this faded, almost fabled conversation between Martini and Ratzinger. And, you know, they, they, they voted a few times and there was no clear front runner. He, he was in first place, but he didn't have the quorum necessary to be a front runner. And um, it was at lunch, and after that conversation, all of the Sankt Gallen support seemed to be thrown to Ratzinger, and that, that kind of ended the debates. Is that an accurate enough read to insinuate that, well, I'm not going to say it out loud, but no one wants to say it, but does that insinuate what I think it insinuates, or, or what? <laughs> um, I... I mean, it, it's such delicate um, material, obviously. Um, right. Yeah, you don't have I, to get yourself in trouble. Right. I, what I would say is um, I pers personally, um, when I try to read this, I try to think about each man and what I know about his character and his life. So yeah. uh, there was a lot of, of research that I did that did not make it into the book explicitly where I'm just reading, okay, who is Joseph Ratzinger? How does his mind work? That sort of thing. Um, I personally, from what I know of Ratzinger, when, when Ratzinger denied that there was some sort of pact, um, I, I personally believe that. I don't think yeah. there was a pact and I don't think he wanted to be Pope. Now, do I think 
well, let, let me put it this way. Um, Martini's confessor, Silvano Fosti, said that Martini went to um, Ratzinger and said, tomorrow accept the papacy with my votes. And if you can't reform everything, you leave. And that to me, it sounds, it's like an order. It's, it's, it's like a command. It's not, it's not like a, oh, don't you wanna be Pope? Let's see how we can bargain and I can give you my votes if, if you do something. Right. Um, th there's, there's something kind of ominous about that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know if Ra if Martini went to him and said something like, um, you know, you. I'm going to give you my votes to to become Pope, but dot dot dot. <laughs> there's that there, there, there's an implication that that there's something that was said about him being a transitional Pope. There's actually this line, I didn't put it in the book because it was kind of, my thoughts were kind of fuzzy on this issue, but um, Marco Politi, the Italian Vaticanista has a um, book called J Joseph Ratzinger and it's in Italian. And um, he, he basically says something in there about the, 2000, the, the, the 2005 conclave. There was word that, that Benedict was going to be a transitional pope, basically, um, and of course, when we we know from a couple of different cardinals that after he was elected, he said, you know, part of the reason he took the name Benedict was because there had been a, a previous pope Benedict um, who had had a short reign. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, again, how much of this is him? he doesn't want to, maybe he doesn't want to be Pope. He's um, willing to be a, be, be a transitional Pope, accepted if he can be a transitional Pope. How much of, how much of this was, um, you know, something, something more ominous. It, it's, it's frankly very ambiguous. Yes. Yeah, so much, so much mystery. It's like, mystery shrouded in enigma you never get to the bottom i mean i learned so much reading your book and I, I i know a lot about i thought i knew a lot about sankt gallen mafia and francis's darkling origins before your book and then i read your book and i'm like wow this is all purely new stuff you know, this is not one of those books that comes out and you're basically reading regurgitated stuff you did a pretty deep dive um not just into uh, Seer, but into his sources and into a lot of other languages. Into Silvestrini, I want to congratulate you. Your background on Silvestrini is really interesting. And the others, the other members of the Mafia, one gets a, a nice kind of um, close close synopsis. But um, Silvestrini I found particularly enlightening. But it's like, at the end of all that, there are just more questions. And that sounds like some, you know smarmy journalist thing to say but literally there's a lot more granularity and detail and it i will say this conclusively francis does not come out looking like hey you know i caught the pontificate free of an agenda i mean not anything like that it, it's definitely martini's agenda and uh francis is in some ways acting it out but he does seem like a strong man also so I don't know. Um, yeah, just good stuff. Really good stuff. I really want to congratulate you on writing it. And uh, do you have any any kind of closing wisdom for the folks out there? Because aside from read your book, because there's so much good stuff in it. Um, I, I think that I think it's important to just um, you know again some some people have been in this in this endeavor, this battle, you know, for, for years re reading about the Francis pontificate, there might be some fatigue to some of it. Um, some people are, are just newly getting into it and everything. But I, I think it's really important um, to, to me, uh, just to go back to Traditionis Custodis. Um, and to me, this was the beginning of, of another act, let's say, 
Um, I, I use this, you're familiar with this um, because you read the book, but I use this analogy of, of Chekhov's gun. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea in drama that you have, um, if you have a gun on the mantelpiece in say act one, it needs to go off in act three. Mm -hmm. And to put it another way, if you have a gun going off in act three, some hand must have placed it it on the mantelpiece in act one. And so the, the, the book tries to cover, you know, the, again, the backstory and everything, but Tradicionis Custodis, that was the, the bomb, the gunshot, whatever you want to call it, going off in act three, maybe inaugurating act, act three. And as we were saying earlier, the, the idea that things, things could accelerate um, when, when you're towards the end. I think it's just really important for people to, um, you know, e even if you're feeling burned out on, on some of this stuff, just to, to continue to follow it, continue to um, speak up about it, continue to educate yourself about it, because um, some of the things that may be coming at us, um, one, of, one of our only weapons, you know, to protect ourselves against it will be to, to speak up and, and to um, create knowledge about, about, you know, what's going on. Yeah. I like, I'm curious where to place genuinely curious and, and neither of us might have the answer here, but for me, the big moment was a more Letizia because that's still mm -hmm. such a big thing that, that he fiddled with. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis faith and morals, right? If all of a sudden now you're saying it's really eight of those propositions from Amoris Laetitia that you know hell can't punish forever, and you know mortal sin can't really be mortal, and you know you can give the Eucharist; it's not a prize for the perfect. It's like, well, no, it's a prize for the recently confessed. You know, mm -hmm. that's basically what it's a prize for. I, I just, to me, it's like, well, that's a big set piece in act two, at least. And I, I do think that that's when the mask came off. And I, I'd suspected the guy for, for three years and had watched how he'd behaved at all those first synods. So I, I wonder now, I think your book is first off really important to read because more darkling stuff is coming, more abrupt stuff. He's saying to expect surprises from the synod on synodality. That just didn't. It's just a wicked, wicked prelate. And when he's saying to expect the surprises preemptively, you know, uh, ex ante, something's really going to be jolting. He usually um, has said the God of surprises bit, kind of like you say, time is greater than space. He has these, uh, you know, rejoinders that he'll defend himself with after ex post making some jolting move. But he's never said beforehand, hey, it's going to be big. This, this, this is going to be abrupt. Look out for the God of surprises. I, that tells me it's going to be twice or thrice as surprising as any of his moves so far. And I couldn't even imagine what that would be, aside from you know the Brand Mueller predictions for Sankt Gallen agenda. So I'd urge people to read Sankt Gallen Mafia because there's already been enough bad stuff that we need some sort of dot connection. And um, there's going to be more. I, I don't agree with De Mate that that um, we're at the end of it. There, there is no terminus here. There's only one one way out. And Francis seems to be okay after his uh, mysterious surgery of, of last summer. So I'd say it's a great, I don't know, antidote or half an antidote anyway. Understand that this guy has origins he has an agenda. The agenda was passed on from others, but he seems to be a spirited, um, more than a summer soldier, a spirited soldier in the fight. And um, it does feel better and does heal the soul to the extent that one says, okay, I get where he's coming from. We've never been taught as Catholics that prelates can't be evil or that they don't hold their own under the um, you know, emblazonment of the Holy Spirit's protection of the office, that they don't hold their own free will in office. That's not the, the case. If they're evil guys, they're going to do evil things. And your book just gives us a, an etiology, you know, a, for, a study of first causes for why Francis is doing so much evil stuff. So it's just really great. Now, I, all I can say is 
it reads a little bit like uh, an exciting fiction novel, but it's all true. And it's just a, a really amazing book. One of, one of my, my favorite um, Catholic nonfiction, my, my favorite um, Catholic nonfiction books I've read in the last five years. So, so excellent job. And thanks for joining me on your pub date, Julia. Are there any other shout outs you'd, you'd like to shout out in closing? Yeah, so I um, I just want to thank my my publisher Tan Books and Patrick O'Hearn, who I knew I know was on the show recently. Um, they they really they made this book happen, and the cover is incredible. And that was something that they <clears throat> completely did, um, you know, kind of as a surprise for me. And I totally appreciate that. I also want to. Um, <clears throat> I also just want to, you know, say thank you to Tim because Tim um, has been supportive of this project, you know, since since almost the very beginning, and um, he was one of the first people that I showed my first chapter to, and he gave me feedback and and everything. So thank you, thank you so much, Tim, for for writing the forward and supporting the, the book and everything. You're more than welcome. It's it's been an honor, and it's a great book. Just an excellent read. So, it's nice to be able to put your money where your mouth is in a way that's entertaining and fruitful and good for the world. And and that's what it was to support this book. And I hope it it sells off the shelves. And I think it will. Everyone's interested in this topic, and um, even some secular conservative friends of mine have talked about having you on their show. And I I think um, the more we get the word out the better. So that that's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to hook you up with uh, some of those too, because people need to know that Catholics don't have to worship the Pope. People have been on my case, you know, the last couple months, uh, because there are some ways that we have to be obedient that are codified, but they are not the ways that the Pope's planners say, right? The Pope's planners for over eight years now have been saying, well, we can't criticize them at all. That's just not Catholic. That is what the Protestants always accused us of. But look, I mean, if the Pope exercises one of his uh, authorities in whatever faith, morals, discipline in a way that uh, is there for him to prudentially act, enact, then I don't know what to do. You know, I'm not a wishful thinker. We're just out of luck. But when the Pope is doing stuff, particularly stuff behind the scenes that's not so well hidden, and he has an agenda that's not so well hidden, then it's great. To, have, to read a book like yours, um, I, I really think this is going to be go down as one of the, the best Pope Francis books. It, it, you know, I like I like Henry Sears book, but um, this to me gets even closer to the heart of the matter. So it was a real honor and we're out of time. And I know you're doing a slew of other interviews, but um, great work, Julia. People go purchase the book from Tan Books today or Amazon. And uh, let's make this thing a bestseller. God bless you all. Julia, thanks for coming on today. Thank you so much, Tim. Deus Volt, people. Stay strong. Keep your head on a swivel. We will be back with more. Peace. <laughs>